What song did you want to sing? Uh, the Little Green Frog. What song do you want to sing, Grant? Blue Skies and Rainbow. All right. All right, let's get the books of the Bible first. Are you ready? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. That's good. That was 39. Let's do the new. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Okay, good. Now, you want to sing the little green frog? All right, here we go. I'm a little green frog and God loves me. I'm a little green frog and God loves me. I'm a little green frog and God loves me. Croak, croak, croak. I'm a medium-sized frog and God loves me. I'm a medium-sized frog and God loves me. I'm a medium-sized frog and God loves me. Croak, croak, croak. I'm a big bullfrog and God loves me. I'm a big bullfrog and God loves me. I'm a big bullfrog and God loves me. Croak, croak, croak. Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see. When the Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart. Nevermore will I be all alone since he promised me that we never would part. Okay, three Sunday nights ago, it's kind of hard to believe that, not last Sunday, but Sunday night before that, we read, a, we read about Daniel in the lion's den. And you remember Daniel was put in the lion's den for praying to God. Isn't that something? Well, tonight, let's see what happened, and we, we may talk about this again next week too, but what happened to Daniel when they put him in the lion's den? Let me show you a picture, Laurel. This one, I want to show you too. Look at there, see there? See that little picture? There's old, there's old Daniel in the lion's den. Are the lions hurting him? No, they're not hurting him. Look at that. He's just sitting there, I guess, around the lions. They're just looking at him. They're not eating on him or anything like that, biting him. Okay. Now, this is found in Daniel chapter 6. Hello, Alana. Jordan. Daniel is saved from the lions. Now, when we get through, I'll ask you about three questions. All right, that be good? After King Darius looked, locked Daniel in the lion's den, he couldn't sleep. You know, he's, uh, he's worried. He can't sleep. He, did, he liked Daniel. He got fooled by these old bad fellows into making that law. Well, he didn't sleep. He was worried about Daniel. Early the next morning, the king ran to the lion's den. He ran, ran down there, and he called out and said, Daniel... Has your God kept you safe from the lions? The king thought he would hear the lions roar, but instead he heard the voice of Daniel. Come on in, Anna Mason, Pierce Adam. And here's what Daniel said. God sent his angel. You reckon y'all can remember that? God sent his angel who shut the lions' mouths. He knew I had done nothing wrong. The lions haven't hurt me. So the king took Daniel out of the den. He punished the men who were so jealous of Daniel. Now, what happened to the king that night after Daniel was put in the lion's den? Did he have a good night's sleep? What happened? He, he couldn't sleep. Why could he not sleep? He was worried about Daniel. Okay, now... How, how soon did he go and see about Daniel? The next what? The next morning. He went out there and he called Daniel. 
And he was afraid he wouldn't hear him, but Daniel said what? He said, my God has done what to the lion's mouths? Shut them. He said he shut them. All right. Now, uh, did, did King Darius know that Daniel had not done anything wrong? And yes, he did. He, he, Daniel didn't do anything wrong, did he? No, he didn't do anything wrong. So he knew that he, has, he had not done anything wrong. But now, you know what happened to those men that got that bad law made? You know what happened to them? They got thrown in the lion's den, and the angel didn't shut the lion's mouth that time. They ate them. That's bad, isn't it? But that was all because of being such bad men. All right, let's, let's talk about the prayer again, and then we will have a few more songs. We'll let Kai pick a song and Anna Mason and Pierce Adam. Y'all be thinking about a song, okay? What you want to sing? Blue skies. All right, we'll sing it. We sing. We'll sing it again. All right, here we go. When we start talking about who we pray for, who is this right here that we pray for? Those closest to us. Who are the ones closest to you? Your family, your father, your mother, your family, um, your grandparents, brothers or sisters. Who else do we pray for? Who's this one? Those in authority. And that's like the president, the governor, the fire chief, the police chief. And then who's this one? Who's that one? Those that are who, what in the church? Leaders. Who are the leaders in the church? Phil Sullivan, Jerry Cooper, Tim Dixon. And I just say that, but that Phil was a uh, elder first, uh, and then Jerry was, and then Tim was. Okay, we need to pray for them that they can watch for everybody in the church. All right, and then who's this one? The weak. That's people that are sick. Sometimes in our families we have people that are sick, but we pray for different ones that are sick and ask God to bless and help them. And who's that one? Me. You need to pray for yourself and ask God to help you to be a good boy and a girl. And uh, it's too loud. A good boy or a good girl. Now, now uh, don't forget to say your prayers when you eat your meals. Say your prayers before you go to sleep tonight. And uh, say your prayers when you get up in the morning. Always need to talk to God and thank him and ask him to bless you. All right. What do you want to sing, Pierce Adam? What song do you want to sing? Oh, the devil's a sly old fox. Okay. What about Anna Mason? The what now? Which one? Oh, the little green frog? Okay. Okay, well, that's all right. We're going to sing. We're going to sing two of these again, and then we're going to get the old sly fox. Ready? I'm a little. No, you wanted to. Blue skies, right? Which ones you want? The frog or the blue skies? Rainbow. The frog. Okay, that's right. I'm a little green frog and God loves me. I'm a little green frog and God loves me. I'm a little green frog and God loves me. Croak, croak, croak. I'm a medium-sized frog and God loves me. I'm a medium-sized frog and God loves me. I'm a medium-sized frog and God loves me. Croak, croak, croak. I'm a big bull frog and God loves me. I'm a big bull frog and God loves me. I'm a big bull frog and God loves me. Croak, croak, croak. All right. Now, the devil is a sly old fox. If I could catch him, I'd lock him in a box. Lock him in a box and throw away the key for all the mean things he's done to me. I love Jesus. I love Jesus, I love Jesus more and more each day. Blue skies, is that what you said? Which one did you say? Oh, we got it. Okay, well, what? let's sing one more. Let's sing. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Okay, y'all can go back to your folks now. Thank you. All right, whoever our song leader is and the ones to lead the prayer, we're ready.
fourth verses of that song. <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but I prayer uh, tonight we'll sing number 507 507 uh, brother phil was to be leading singing tonight and uh, when i talked with him this morning he requested that that uh, as i take his place we sing this song together we'll sing uh, all three verses <clears throat> Does Jesus care when my heart is pain too deeply for mirth and song? As the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long. Oh yes, he cares, I know he cares, his heart is touched with my grief. bow with me. My Father in heaven, we, we love you, Lord, and we, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that we have had to, to worship this morning and to come and assemble again uh, together as, as Christians, as those who 
seek the truth, Lord, and who, who want to be closer to you and more like you. Lord, we, we ask as we go through this uh, evening service that we do it in a way that's pleasing to you, Lord. We ask that you help us to, uh, to, to find truth in what we hear and apply it to our lives and, and take it with us when we leave this place today, Lord. Lord, we, we have so many in this congregation that are, that are hurting, Lord, who are uh, suffering in, in, in many ways, whether it uh, be physical or mental or spiritual, Lord. We, we uh, pray for those who are uh, fighting various battles, Lord. We, we pray for, particularly for the, the Whitehead and Sullivan family and the tragedy that they have faced, Lord. We, we, we know that... that, that uh, that, that you that you care, Lord. We we know that uh, Jesus, our Savior, uh, weeps with us when we suffer and when when uh, loved ones leave this world. And and we ask, Lord, that you help us to understand or 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 try to try understand that that your ways are above our ways and and uh, we, that you love us and that you're with us and that you'll help us through, Lord. We pray for. The leaders of this congregation and the work that they do, uh, we thank you for the good week that, that uh, had at Maywood this past week and for the, the saves that came from that, Lord, and we ask that that work continue. We pray for uh, Abel and for Philip and for the elders here and all that they do that you help them to uh, be leaders and to, to help move this congregation forward in a way that's pleasing to you. Lord, as always, we, we thank you for your son Jesus, for the love he has for us, for the sacrifice he made for us, and the hope that we have for eternal salvation through him. And it's through him, Lord, that we pray now. Amen. Well, thank you for singing all three verses of that song, even though it seems that I couldn't get there tonight. Um, <clears throat> we'll sing in the same opening, though, number 508. 508, uh, and we'll stand and sing this song, uh, and then Philip will bring us our lesson. <clears throat> oh, wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Oh, see you this evening. I hope you had a good day today. 
as well as possible. We've had a beautiful day to be very thankful for. We've had uh, three baptisms of young people recently. Connor was baptized by Randall, his father at camp. And Cohen was baptized today by, by his father. And uh, then Abel had the privilege of baptizing Jaws Burrell at the church today. So we're very happy about that. And be sure and see them all and speak to them. This evening, let's talk for a few minutes about the better things that are contrasted in James, the better things. Um, I hope certainly all of us are concerned about better things. We, we like better things than bad things, certainly, but we'll be concerned about better things, and I do believe that all of us have a sincere desire to live in heaven. I believe that about every one of us. We want to go to heaven. And we realize to a great extent well, we've got to do certain things. We've got to live a certain way. We have to avoid certain things. We've got to do certain things. So let's talk about some of the better things contrasted in the book of James. All of us need to be reading and studying uh, the Bible. And there, we, need, we need to read all the books. There's something in every book. You'll find something in every book that will help you. We all will in our life, in our efforts to obey God. There'll be something we'll learn from example or whatever. But there's something in every book. In the Old Testament, just for daily living, you sure don't want to leave the book of Proverbs out. Proverbs is so great. It, it, it is a book of practical obedience to God and just good common sense. It'll, if, if we read the book of Proverbs, it'll keep us out of trouble. There's just no doubt about it if we read it and do what it says. It'll help young people not uh, make many mistakes to start with in life if they, if they are helped to read and understand the book of Proverbs. And then the book of James is, is referred to as a book of practical, helpful, daily Christian living. And sometimes James and Proverbs are referred to each other in the sense that they're, they're very much alike in that sense. Uh, Christianity was not the thing in Proverbs, but it's the thing about obeying God. James does involve Christianity. James, if we read it and study it and think about it and pray about it, and it's very good always before we ever start reading, we should pray. And uh, sometimes we, we forget to do that, but we ought to be praying about it. But if we read and pray and read, we're going to find in the book of James the solutions to so many things that would hinder our daily Christian living if we just listen to what he's saying. So first of all, we have mentioned tonight we need to contrast what we know versus what we, ought, versus what we ought to know. We all could say we know certain things. We know certain things about what is taught in James. But there are other things that we ought to know. And uh, we're probably not going to be excused from that. Just what I understand as a minister, preacher, what you understand... There are things that we're not going to be excused from if we did not know them when we stand before Jesus. Now, Jesus might excuse some things. I don't know. <clears throat> he might. But there are other things he's not going to excuse us from. And it has primarily, surely, about our conduct and our actions toward one another and other people. Those things will not be excused. One of the simplest things we can do as Christians is just act right toward everybody. You know, if you want to act ugly... Act ugly at home by yourself. Don't do it in front of your wife or your husband. That would be terrible treatment of them, abuse of them. I wouldn't act ugly to the dog. My dog's never done anything to me. I don't have one right now anyway, so. That's not going to be excused. Grown people who from time to time have made statements about what ought to be done to that child because of the way that child's acting and then turn around and act in a similar way as a grown, that's terrible. We're going to have to give account for what we ought to to know as well as for what we know. James 4 verse 14 he says here yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. None of us know what tomorrow is going to bring. We are very saddened about the death of this baby. All of us are. I haven't seen the baby yet. I, I think I saw a little picture of it. I hadn't got to see it yet. But I've been very sad about it. And I'll tell you this, one of the things furthest from my mind last night when I 
got to go to bed was about that baby dying. I, I knew the baby had had some problems. I knew that some things were better, and I knew that they were going to be working on some other things, but I sure wasn't expecting what the call we got last night. I wasn't expecting that. Were you? No. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't know what's going to happen to us tomorrow. I've said so many times, and it's not just a little trite saying. There are a lot of people going to go to bed tonight, and tomorrow they're going to wake up in the next world. They had no idea about it. Some of them, going, we would say about some of them, well, I didn't know there was a thing in the world wrong with that person. Might not have been, but something, things happen, you know. They're going to wake up in the next world. But they weren't intending to do that. They had plans. In fact, they had plans for tomorrow. They had plans for the whole week. Many of them had plans for this whole summer and, and in the fall. But they're not going to get to carry them out. You remember what Jesus said about that man? Had all those barns. God blessed him with such a great, great crop. He didn't give God a thanks about any of it. All he was talking about himself was, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to tear my barns down because uh, I don't have enough room. My barns are full. He didn't seem to thank God about that. And I'm going to have to have some more room to put things. I wonder if he ever thought about anybody else. Why was he not thinking about, well, since God had blessed him so much, giving some people some of the things he had in those barns? There's a lot, there were always people in that country in that day and time who had need. There were widow women and there were children that were orphans. They had need always. You can read about it. You didn't think about them. I'm going, to build, I'm going to build these big barns and I'm going to put all my stuff in there and I'm going to sit down and I'm going to eat and drink and I'm going to just be merry. And you remember what God said to him? Thou fool, tonight I'm going to bring your soul to me. And then who is going to own all these things? A lot of people making plans for tomorrow. And they'll never get to carry them out. What is your life, he says. He says, for you are a mist. The old King James says, for what is your life? It is even a vapor, if you want to call it a mist, a vapor. It appears for a little time, then vanisheth away. Well, you see, uh, we know certain things. And we ought to know the truth about the frailty of life. Someone talks about, well, I'm hell and hearty. Nothing hurts me. Okay, well, that's wonderful. That's great. I heard about a lot of hell and hearty athletes that for whatever reason died during the night. So what's that got to do with it? I'm hell and hearty. I'd driven some cars. I thought they were hell and hearty till they broke down. <laughs> They'd been that way fine for a long time. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm hell and hearty. We need to be careful to do right because we do not know if we're ever going to have a change, a chance, opportunity. I'm going to say that word, an opportunity to change it. There are people I've known of all my life. They, they're doing things. They're acting in ways. They know not, it's not right. And what, someone would call it a game. What kind of game are they playing? They're playing a kind of game where they think they're going to have some opportunity before they draw their last breath. That is one of the most foolish, ignorant games you could ever play in any kind of thing of all. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and do what I want to do now, but I'm, I'm going to straighten it up a little bit later. You know anything more foolish than that? That's the biggest gamble of any. Gambling with one's soul, eternal soul, an eternal soul. I'm going to do what I want to right now. I'll treat people like I want to right now, but I'll get it right before I die. Oh, you will. What would Jesus call you or God call you or me if we had that attitude tonight? He wouldn't be good. We better take care of the things that we ought to take care of as well as the things that we know. A lot of things we don't know. We also ought to contrast what we know with what we ought to know when it comes to this, James 4, 17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him it is sin. Therefore to him knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him is sin. Those of us who know to do good and we don't do it, it is sin. What sin is going to keep us out of heaven? Any sin we don't get forgiveness of. It doesn't matter which one it is. You'd think the long list. Be any one we don't take care of. Well, James 4.13, when you go back above those verses, which we studied this back a couple of years ago in the oratorium, book of James, enjoyed that great study. I thought it was a great study. 
he talked about these arrogant people. You know what an arrogant person is. We've all seen plenty of them. Uh, we may have some in our family. Uh, everywhere I've ever been, outside the church, and sadly to say a few inside the church, they've been arrogant people. Well, we contrast what we say versus what we ought to say. James 4, 13, what, what are we saying? Do we listen very carefully to what people say? We talked about this morning how Satan phrased that to Eve. Are you allowed to eat of all the trees in the garden? He knew what God had said. You can eat of all of them. He was tempting her right there. He was cunningly trying to deceive her right there. What, what's he implying? You can't eat of all the trees. That's exactly what he's implying. And then, bless her heart, Eve, Eve comes along. Don't you love Eve? I love Eve. I'm thankful for her. Adam too. Eve said, oh, we may eat of all the trees in the garden except the one in the middle of the garden. Because God said if we eat of that one, we're going to die. He said we'll die if we even touch it. Well, the devil knew that. But you see what the devil's trying to make? He's trying to make the whole situation a whole lot bigger. All right, if you've got 100 trees out here and you, eat, you can eat of 99 of them, isn't that a pretty good deal if you can only eat of one? What if you had 100 trees and you could only eat of one couldn't eat of the 99? I think that would be a pretty bad deal. And that's what he was trying to make her think. Don't you realize how bad God's being to you? She didn't fall for that part of it. She fell for the I part. Then he says here in James 4.13, I think the New English Version says it this way, Come now, you who say. The old King James says, Go to now, you that say. I've been telling you all along, go to now is an old English phrase which means wait just a minute. It's what God's saying through James. All right, Phil, if you wait, you said you're going to do what? You wait just a minute. You're going to do what? You got this plan today or tomorrow, we're going to go in such and such a city. We're going to spend a year there. We're going to buy and sell and get gain. You, you're going to go over there today or tomorrow, and you're going to stay there for a year. You're going to buy things and sell things. You're going to make a lot of money. He said, wait just a minute. You're only going to go over there if I allow you to go over there. Same thing, we'll only live through the night if God allows us to live through the night. He's not killing us, but is he going to bless us and allow us to live? We need to contrast what we say versus what we ought to say. He says in verse 15 now, Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, you will live and do this or that. If the Lord wills. It's taught all my life by my Good father and mother. They weren't perfect, but they were good people. He was a good father. My mother was a good mother. I haven't been scarred in life because I had a bad father or a bad mother, and I'm so thankful for that. I, I've seen lots of people that are. But I heard all my life, I heard my father say, Lord willing, and I knew what it meant. I heard my mother say it, and I am making a strong practice of it. My children, my grandchildren, and anybody, including people not members of the church, all the time I say something to them, I say, Lord willing. Sometimes they get some funny looks. That's all right. I'm trying to teach them a little something. Lord willing, we're going to do whatever we plan on doing tomorrow if it's the Lord's will. For that you ought to say. We need to know the difference and the contrast by what we say and what we ought to say. We ought to say it right. Do we think that God is pleased with us when we just say things like these arrogant people? These are arrogant people. Or do we think he's pleased with us and maybe blesses us more if we say that we trust in him and we humble ourselves for him? Which way do you think God likes it the best? He's sitting on his throne. He sees and hears everything. He either likes it and approves of it or he doesn't. Everything we say, everything we think, he's good to us. He loves us. been blessing us all of our lives, but he's still thinking about what we're saying and what we're doing and why. Well, there's a great contrast there. What we say versus what we ought to say. Then let's, let's contrast this. What we do versus what we ought to do. We're all doing things all the time. Man, we've been doing things all day. We're going to be doing some things tonight, Lord willing. But we are always doing things. We've already said we've got all these things we plan to do tomorrow. You know. And I've got a whole list of things I know I need to do tomorrow. Don't you? I'm sure you do. Well, James 4, verse 16, 
as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. All right, we, we talk about what we're going to do versus what we ought to do. When we're doing things, all these things we're going to do tomorrow, do we spend a little time thinking about what we ought to be doing for the Lord? We're doing all these things. What should we be doing for the Lord? Does the Lord want us to spend all of our time on just doing things for ourselves? Or does he want us to spend some things on spiritual things? I think he wants us to spend some time on spiritual things. As well as the things, he, he's taking care of us about all these things about life, food, clothing, and shelter. But he's also expecting us to take care of some things spiritually. You've heard it said, it's, it's all right to say it like this. What are we? We're, we're the Lord's hands, we're his feet, okay? We're his eyes, ears, we're his mouth. Well, that's the truth. No matter if we, that's, if we like that's the way it's expressed or not, but that's the truth. You know, he talks about there in the book of James about these people that come and they need some help. And he's talking to the church there. He's talking to the congregation there. And he says, these people come up to you and, and they say they need some help. They don't have enough to eat. They don't have enough to wear or something like that. And you say to them, uh, bless you, go your way, be warmed and filled. What did you do for them? Absolutely nothing. Was God pleased with that? Absolutely not. Because you ought to have done something for them. And every time we do something for others, God's going to bless us. Think about it like this, brethren. Recently I had someone to do something for me. And Cindy and I talked about what we ought to do. And we decided about what we ought to pay the person. I thought I was going to have to drop it in the yard and leave. No, 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 no. And I finally said, listen. If you do not take this, here's what I told him, Leslie. You're robbing God from blessing me. I told him that two or three times, looking him straight in the eye, and I meant it. If you don't take this, you're taking a blessing away from me. I'm not worried about this. I want to be blessed by God, and I do what's right. What's right? God's going to bless me. Now, Brad, we need to think about it that way. You know, a lot of preachers got a bad name. You know why they got a bad name? Why they're dislike? I never tell anybody I'm a preacher because everybody around here knows I'm one, but I never tell anybody I'm a preacher. You say, were you ashamed? No, but I'll tell you why I don't tell them. Because you've got these preachers all over the place. They go in the first thing they want to ask if they're going to buy something. How much are you going to give me off of that? Or can you just give me that? I never ask them to give me anything like that. And I'm not planning on it. I'm not going to ask them for it. I cannot... Uh, as they call it, Jewing people. Now, I just can't do that. It's not in me. I'll leave that up to my wife. She can do it. I'm not going to do that. We live right, and God's going to take care of us. He says he will, and he will. We don't have to have a big discount every time we want to get something. Like I'm poor little old me, and like I'm, in, I'm on... Skid Row, I, I'm not. I've been blessed. You've been blessed. I don't go over and ask them. I don't want them to dislike the Lord's church because this preacher in the Lord's church, you know what? I, and I go off and they say, you know, he's always wanting something. I just see when he comes in, his eyes all over things. I don't want him to say something like that and think anything like that. How could I talk to him about the Lord? How could I talk to him about the church? I don't want him to think anything like that. And I'm not worried about being taken care of because God's going to take care of me as long as I do what's right. What we do must be contrasted with what we ought to do. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, that person sins. And that includes trusting God, always trusting God about everything. These are just a few little suggestions so far of what we ought to do. Now, have there been good people in days gone by? I mean, really good people that struggled with this? Oh, yes. I, I think all of us struggle with these things from time to time. Surely we all do. I don't think I'm the only one. I try hard, but, you know, I need to do better. You remember that man called Paul, the apostle? What did Paul say? An inspired apostle of God, a man able to raise people from the dead, work all kind of great miracles. What did he say? Romans chapter 7, verse 15, he said this. 
for I do not understand my own actions. Now, isn't that something? He wasn't crazy. Highly intelligent man, a great man of God, a great Christian, wrote by inspiration, penned most of the New Testament. But he says, I don't understand myself. I don't understand my actions. What do you mean, Paul? He says, for I do not what I do not do, what I ought to do, what I want to do, and many times I do the very thing I hate. He says, there's just these times that I'm doing these things and, and I, I don't want to do that. Or I'm not doing these things I want to do. And I got it reverse order there, but I, I'm not doing what I ought to do. It's a great contrast with what we do and what we ought to do. Paul wasn't the only one that could say that. I would think the other apostles, in all honesty, could say that. But we've got to make the great contrast. What we do, now I'm doing this now, is that what I ought to do? This is my action. Is that what my action ought to be? I'm saying something, doing something. I'm thinking something. Is that what my thinking ought to be? We want to go to heaven? We're going to get those things right. We're going to work on them and work on them and work on them. Probably going to take us all of our life. But that'll be great if we're working on it when the end comes, won't it? Won't that be great? Now, contrast what we appear to be with what we really are. Are we what we appear to be? Or are we some type of a hypocrite? There won't be any hypocrites in heaven. <laughs> I always think about that. I said, uh, I don't want to go to church tonight because I'm a bunch of hypocrites down there. That's one of the craziest, most ignorant, foolish statements I ever heard in my life. There's hypocrites everywhere. What do they think going to be in hell? It's going to be full of them. Going to go there with them. So now, wh what's the real problem? Is the real problem the hypocrites there, or is it the one that said it? That's the one that said it. That's where the real problem is, not the hypocrites there. And how does that person know who all down there is a hypocrite or not? What have they been doing? I think they've been minding too much business that wasn't their own. And I think if they'd been doing better to take care of their own business and take care of their own life, they would have had all this other stuff <laughs> going through their mind. What do you think, brethren? What do you think? Well, James 4, 13 and 14, once again, as we get ready to close it. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, we're going to go into such a city, a town. We're going to spend a year there. We're going to buy and sell and get gain. We're going to trade. We're going to make a profit. We're going to make a profit. I wonder how they intended to spend it. I, I believe James, he's talking about real people. He knows, right? He put names on it. I wonder how they plan on spending that profit they're going to make. He says, yet you do not know what's going to be on the morrow. What do you reckon some of those people sitting out in, I don't know what they were, I don't know if they were on pews or I don't know what they were sitting in at the church there where James is having reference to. I have no idea. But I wonder what some of those folks sitting there when they heard James saying this, and they should have known this is coming from the throne of heaven. I just wonder what they thought. And here's the bigger thing I wonder. How many of them changed their life or went on and died and going to go to hell because they didn't? That's what I really wonder. Wait a minute, he says. What's your life? So a mist, it's a vapor, appear for a little time, then vanisheth away. I hope they made a change. I hope we think about these things that are great contrast. And we make the right choice. We make the right changes as we're living our lives. I thank you for your very kind attention. I hope this helps all of us. Always pray before and after the sermon when I start home. I hope that this helps us. <laughs> I hope it helps you, but I hope it helps me too. I hope it helps us. We need to get out of this world saved. You know that, brethren. And if you don't, just keep your eyes open. I hope it helps us. I hope God's pleased with our feeble, our feeble efforts, but I hope it helps us. And I sincerely hope we do better tomorrow than we did today, so on and so forth. If you're here and never obeyed the gospel of Christ, there's some here who have never obeyed the gospel of Christ. We'd love to assist you. We hope that you'd obey tonight. If you don't obey tonight, we hope you have another opportunity, but we'd love to assist you in repentance. Surely you're not proud of ever hurting God, anybody else. Repentance, 
Surely you believe that Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross for you, whether you accept it or not, that he loved you? And surely you believe that Jesus Christ has the power in his blood to wash away your eternal soul. Why not do something about it that's good and right? If we need the prayers of the church, we have opportunity to come while we stand and while we sing. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey, trust and obey. to trust and obey not a shadow can rise not a cloud in the skies but his smile quickly drives it away not a doubt nor a fear not a sign or a tear can to be our closing song just a few minutes I want to um, make just a few announcements here again <coughs> please remember these that we've been asked to remember that are sick remember the Whitehead and Sullivan families and their loss and also please remember uh, those who've asked already for prayers of the church Roy and Joanne Dabbs we love and appreciate them so very much and um, don't forget the request for help about Vacation Bible School. Sign the list. And please remember these who have just recently obeyed the gospel, uh, Connor Nevins, and then today, Josh Burrell. Also, you might want to remember uh, Cohen Cooper. His family was there today and got to see that, and they'd be happy to hear good things from you. Now, I've got uh, two statements from Randy and Ann Gray. I'm going to read them, and then we'll have prayer before we have our close. Brother Randy Gray says, I am asking forgiveness for sins and weakness of faith in my life. I have let worldly things get between me and my spiritual life. I have done and said things a Christian shouldn't do and amiss. I have missed some worship services that I should not have missed. If I have said things or offended any church family member, I ask forgiveness and I'm going to strive to be a worker and evangelist for the Lord. I ask God in heaven for forgiveness and the church. Anne says, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for the prayers, the love, and concern you have sent my way during my illness, my illnesses and treatments. I am so thankful for, for and love each of you. Please continue to pray for me as I journey through the rest of my time on earth. I ask for forgiveness for any wrong, wrong perceived, any misspoken words, or anything that might be amiss with anyone in any way. I love you all. I ask my Heavenly Father for forgiveness. 
for my sins and wrongdoing, unbeknownst or otherwise in my life. I am truly sorry for all my shortcomings. My prayer is each day to be a better Christian and to strive to do more in service to him so that I can achieve a seat in heaven when my life has ended. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so very thankful to come before thee in reverence and humility for thy greatness beyond our understanding, but our belief, and for thy goodness and thy mercies to us all. And we're thankful that thou dost love us and thou dost care about us, and that this is made known, made known to us daily and nightly in all the many ways that we are so richly blessed in life and we believe in death. We are thankful, Heavenly Father, for the Lord's church that we can be a part of it and we can know thy will. We've got a Bible and we can know what thou wouldst have us to do and we have the opportunity to do it. And we're thankful for every member here. And we're thankful for Randy and Ann for their many years of service and faithfulness in this congregation in helping in different ways, we thank thee for them. And we're so very thankful that they want to make sure that things are right with them in every way because of their great desire to live with thee in heaven. We pray that thou wouldst look down upon them and those things that would stand between them and thee, that they, as they ask humbly, might be forgiven, that thou wouldst continue to bless and help them in their lives. We're so very thankful for them. We are thankful for thee, and we are so thankful that Christ was willing to make that great sacrifice that we could ask forgiveness and receive it and the assurance of a home in heaven with thee. Please continue to watch over, bless, and keep us all this night and on through the future walks of life. And when it comes our time to leave this world, we pray truly that we might have the peaceful hour in which to do so, that we might be received to thee and be able to have the home in heaven with thee and all the heavenly host, and with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. We humbly ask these things in the name of Christ our Savior, and amen. I hope you have a good evening. We look forward to see you Wednesday night in the class in here. I'll have the new book for us, but we'll have a lesson uh, about quotations that you will not find in the Bible. We'll give the new book out, and then, Lord willing, the next Wednesday night, we'll start on Passages that can change and have changed people's lives. Stand as we sing. Let me say this. We're going to give Ann and Randy a little wide berth. You know, she doesn't need any one of us to get close to her. So they're going to go on out as we sing. Look forward to see you through the week, and we look forward to see you on Wednesday. We'll sing both verses of uh, number 916. Uh, again, if you uh, didn't have the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper this morning, it's uh, in, a, in a room down the hallway to my right, and you'll be taken care of there. Number 916. <clears throat> That's what I just said. <laughs> Once again, if you didn't have the opportunity to partake, no, um, we'll sing number 916, and, uh, and then we'll be dismissed in prayer. <laughs>
Shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Lord's Day you've blessed us with. And once again, this opportunity to come out to study another portion of our word. We pray that we take the things tonight, apply them to our everyday lives, and always strive to be soul winners for thee. Dear Lord, we ask you to please be with the sick, especially those mentioned here tonight. Please be with them in their respective conditions, dear Lord. We ask you to also be with those who have lost loved ones. Comfort them as only you can, especially at this time, be with the Whitehead family. Dear Lord, we ask you to please be with us as we depart, as we go out about our daily lives. May always, may we always stay true to your word. And we ask you to also please be with the recent converts, and, and may they always stay true to your word and give them long and useful lives in thy service. Please be with us as we depart and bring us back the next morning times. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.